Thank you. For the record, sir, uh, state your name and who you represent. So, so good afternoon. My name is Jamie Wilson. I'm the superintendent of schools for the Denton Independent School District. And um, I'm here in support of Senate Bill 15. And what I've provided to you um, is a copy of our plan that was in alignment with HB 1468 as we went through the um, spring semester. I thought it would be good for you to see what a plan might look like when a district has a lot of time to do on-ramp and ramp up a true virtual academy so that you can see what it looks like. Um, the, very, the front page is a copy of our waiver dated in June that once the legislation um, did not make it across the finish line, we went for plan B. Um, the TEA has worked hand in hand with us along the way to try to find ways for us to fund our virtual academy. Um, we offered our virtual academy to our families with a May 1st enrollment commitment, um, waiting on legislation to be approved. And whenever that did not happen, everybody else has gone on the waiting list. So we're up to about a thousand students now waiting on the list for enrollment in our virtual academy. And um, I would just be here to offer any questions and any support, anything that you need to get some feedback from what we're doing in our school systems. And to Senator Perry's comment earlier about $20 million for 8,000 students, that's about 400 teachers. Um, so if that's 400 teachers at $50,000 a piece, that's about $20 million, just to kind of give you some math about whether those are in person or online. It's still gonna cost you that. Senator West. In terms, you said you have about 1,000 students? So even before this Delta variant started rising up, um, we started getting people just within our district on the wait list for participation in online academy. Um, we petitioned the TEA for its own campus ID number so we could assign students to that academy with leadership and teachers and everyone would really know it was all direct instruction. Um, we have just under 300 students that met the timeline requirements for commitment because we asked back in April. And um, since that point, we get more and more and more each and every day. Um, and our trustees made the commitment to those families that committed to us early because we didn't want to wait till the end of the session to start planning and ramping up a high quality program. How many students do you currently have that are in your uh, virtual program? Well, there's there's 300 that are currently 300. that are currently committed now. Let me, let me back up. How many students in the Denton? Thir 31,000 students. 31, and you have 1,000, 300 in the program. 300 in the program. 1,000 on the waiting list. It's, it's probably approaching 1,000 today, you know, sure. because of the Delta variant. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can scale up relatively quickly. Um, our intention was if we got to the school year and we didn't need it, we could always go back to in-person instruction. Um, but we knew to do a high-quality online program, we needed to spend some time training the teachers, getting everyone online ready to go, um, when school starts. And so when we start classes on Thursday, um, we'll have a dedicated virtual academy for at least 300 students. And if this is favorable in the next week or so, then we'll be able to open up that wait list to others. And so in the bill, there's a 10% cap subject to waiver um, um, by the um, commissioner. Um, you, um, how do you feel about that 10% cap? So I think it's a great place to start. I think if once we and the commissioner has the ability to waive it in the event that we're in a um, in a pandemic or in some kind of health health related issues. And I will tell you exactly where the number came from for us was last February we still had approximately eleven thousand students learning at home, and we were trying to think about how many of those eleven thousand students are going to be ready to come back in August. We asked our team; it was everywhere from five percent to eighty percent. So their guess was as good as mine. So we planned on being able to offer it to about 5%, and then we just kind of worked backwards from there. The 1,000 that you currently have on the waiting list, do you know the reason why they want to take advantage of this option? So I think there's a variety of reasons, most of which were pretty successful whenever they were learning at home that made the early commitment in May because their parents were really engaged in that process. As we progressed through the summer, and we don't have the ability to mandate face coverings, we're having more and more people interested in trying to keep their children safe. And if you'll notice in the application that I provided to you all, 
we were asking for approval for just one year for this for a bridge to get us through the pandemic and then see what happens with a study. So we would also be in favor of the timeline moving to 23 instead of 27 um, as you work through it. A little bit of concern with removing the cap for the three providers, um, because if ISDs are going to have to do MOUs with school districts continuous to them that may want to su support that, there's that whole other piece of the removing the cap for the others that wouldn't require that MOU from a particular school district. So we just might want to look at that just a little bit to see if we're playing by the same rules and guidelines with those three versus ISDs as they move forward. My last question, do you think local school districts should have the option to determine whether or not their students wear masks? Absolutely. I think that the local school districts should have that authority because I, I think that um, it's a big state and there's hot spots at different places across the state during different times. Um, and, you know, while, while you could say we're going to mandate as a school district, can you imagine what it's like for a teacher in a school to say, well, our school district mandated masks. Um, and then the student says, yes, but, you know, we know that you can't do that for us. We, you can't make us do it. Um, so I think it's, I think there's the only people in this state that had to really enforce mask wearing the last year and a half were classroom teachers. All of us making policy, me as a superintendent, doing mandates, it was the classroom teacher every day, pull your mask up, you know, the whole thing. Um, besides in hospitals and those things where it's just general. But school is a place where kids need to come to learn. And if we don't have a virtual option for them to learn at home, our parents are really in a bind. Uh, my email box is full um, of people really concerned about coming back to school on Thursday. So I'm here advocating on behalf of all of them to give them a choice and an option. And if we truly believe that in-person learning is best, which we do for most children, then whatever it takes for them to be in that seat is what we need to do. And then adjust accordingly. Right? That, absolutely. Right. Remain flexible. Always. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent testimony, yeah, Superintendent. Thank you.